program on this episode is prolific Western Australian entrepreneur and company director, Michael Malone, founder of IINet. Michael, pleasure having the opportunity to share your successes and, and journey. I want to bring you back to the start, though, if we could. Born in Ireland in 1969 in a place called Coe Clare. Tell us a little bit about your, your family background there, if you could. Yeah, I was born in County Clare, um, which is on the west coast of Ireland. So it's sort of wedged in between Limerick and Galway, which you probably would have heard of. But I was only a kid when we came out. So, you know, Ireland was tough in the 70s. It had been in a very long term recession. And you know, about one in three people that were born in Ireland in the 20th century ended up migrating. And of course, my family was along with it. Australia was offering sponsorships to bring people out and set them up in regional Australia um, with a job and a house basically to get you started. So my parents took that option up. So it is, you know, in, re in hindsight now, you think about, you know, both they were still in their 20s with three children, four and under, and deciding to pick up and move to the other side of the world where they had no family or anything else there. It was a, it was a big move. So. And if I recall correctly, I think they came out originally in 73 or 74, yes. lived in Queensland for a period, yes. then returned back to Ireland and then made it a second visit, this time permanently moving to yeah. Perth in, in 78. Tell us about the, the shifting uh, dynamics between moving between Ireland to Australia, back to Ireland and finally back to Australia. Yeah, we spent a year in Queensland. Um, but my, my youngest brother had very severe asthma and we, you know, my parents believed it was the weather. So we ended up moving to Perth and settled in very well in Perth and he never had another sick day after that. So the weather was obviously a contributor. Uh, but you know, like a lot of Irish and English that come out here, I think they got very homesick and there was no, we had no family in, in Australia, in Western Australia certainly. So um, after a couple of years, they'd saved up a bit of money and thought, let's go back and see if we can get started again in Ireland. But you know, as, as you'd expect, the same reasons that caused us to leave the first time still, still applied. So after a couple of years across there, we moved back to Perth and, and settled down permanently after that. And if I recall correctly, your, your parents had a, a fencing business that they established. They were working on this business six and a half days in and around Perth. You previously said there was no line between work and home growing up. Customers would be dropping in all the time to pay bills or get quotes. What do you recall of, of that period of your life? Oh, it really was. It was, I mean, I, I, we, we worked because, again, we didn't have any family or, or, or really close friends here when we moved to Perth. So, you know, if we weren't at school, then, of course, my parents had no place they could just drop us off. So after school or on weekends, we'd go out to work with them. And it was just, for our point of view, it was just normal. You know, we got to spend lots of time with family. Uh, I think I've heard other people sort of saying, you know, this is a bit like, you know, kids in the coal mines. But I, I get if you've grown up on a farm or, or similar in a family business, it's, it's not like that. It's... You, know, you come home from school and do you do your farm chores right and um and we were much the same as in you know we got to spend time with mum and dad on the weekends but it, it did form a bit of a iconic picture i think you know um, mum literally on the shovel in the trench and um, dad carrying the material and the two little kids my brother and my second brother the younger one was was too small then but you know my brother and and jj and myself would be out there on the shovel as well and so we became quite well known in the northern suburbs and, and the business, my parents sold the business a few years ago and that business is still operating today some what, close to 50 years later. So. Incredible. I want to ask you about then the, the decision to enrol in a Bachelor of Science specialising in mathematics at the University of Western Australia in 1988. What prompted the, the interest in this field? Well, it, it is funny, I've, you'll laugh now, but um, as a young kid, all I'd ever wanted to be was a journalist. And so I love creative writing and that was what I really saw myself doing. And then in year 11, I got a, a, a maths teacher, Brother Kelly at, at my school, who was just inspirational. And you know, you get, I think you're allowed to have one or two of those in your life. But for me, it was certainly Brother Kelly. I fell in love with maths. Um, I did that through year 11 and 12 and did very well in it. Um, so he passed away only quite recently, just short of a hundred years old. And he was teaching until he was well into his eighties, late eighties. So he, um, He'd been brought back out of retirement just to do us for one year. And at the end of that year, he was like, well, I want to see them get through year 12. So he came back. And then by then, of course, his year 11s, he wanted to see them through one more year and, and so on for another 15 years, well past retirement age. But, um, but for me, I only put down, I, I, I scored very well in my final year, but I only had one thing I wanted to do, which was maths at UWA. So I didn't even put a second option down. That was what I'd always wanted to do. So. Why, why was that? What was the, the impetus for that? Where was the interest? Well, like I said, it was, it was that, that teacher I, I found, you know, I, I was never really sure about what I wanted to do, um, as in I, I was reasonably good at science and maths and writing, um, but, but I wasn't sure which one to pursue. And then when, when the flame got lit, I think that was it then. I wanted to learn more about maths. 
and so went on to do that at UWA and then eventually, you know, I was a pure mathematician, so applied or statistics gets you, you know, obvious jobs in each case. Um, pure maths really meant the, 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 the significant options in that field were all East Coast in, in Canberra. So, in the, I, so teaching was the next, next stage after that. Before we move on, you graduated from UWA in 1993 and I read during which time you developed a, an interest in technology and in particular the, the new frontier that the internet was beginning to offer. Talk us through how this passion was formed and then some of the purposes or ways that you could use the internet in those early days. Yeah, we had messaging apps before that, so you could send emails using something called UUCP or similar. Um, so there was a lot of bulletin board services around where you could send messages that would possibly get transmitted to their destination sometimes. Um, but but the, the internet first came to Australia in about 1988 and UWA was the hub in Western Australia. So I was there when it got connected and people that were in you know science, mathematics, computing areas um, were, were able to use the internet then. And I just fell in love with it. So it was, you know, I, I remember coming home and showing my parents once where I had long cable coming out from the house to the garage where my bedroom was and and showing them, look, I'm chatting to someone in Newcastle in the UK and then switching, well, here's the, the Louvre and um, the New York Gallery. You can look at things that are happening in there and online newspapers, even back, this is in before the web, but there was still stuff available. And they were like, wow, this is really interesting, you know. And then about half an hour later, my mum came out and said, you know, look, your father has said you're not allowed to use the internet again until we see the next phone bill. Right. <laughs> and of course, once they saw the phone bill, no, it wasn't costing international calls, then it was, um, it was all on. But it was just, you know, for, for us at the time, it was very technical. It was the black screen. You needed to know your way around very complicated commands on the Unix command line. Um, there was no World Wide Web. There was no email browsers. There was no Windows, really. Um, you know, you had, you had something similar on, 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 on Unix, but it was, it was very technical. So I guess, um, it, it, we never thought it would be something for the masses. It was much more people that had either deep technical skills or very niche interests. So like genealogists were getting connected back then because then they could use that to connect to other people around the world with niche interests. But it was very much a, a, a niche industry. So even by 1993, we didn't expect it was going to be mass market. And um, that, but then, so when I was leaving uni in 93, I was found, found myself in that situation of I'm going to lose my internet access. What do I do? And, but there were a bunch of other uni students in similar situations, so I asked them, look, if I went and did this, would you be willing to sign up as a customer? And uh, that was the market research. You know, I knew I had 200, if I could get 200 customers paying 25 bucks a month, which was just a finger in the air, as in, that sounds about right, that sounds affordable, um, then that would cover the costs of getting a connection of my own to home. But the purpose really was internet for me. You know, the, the idea of you know, trying to create a big business just wasn't there, because it didn't seem possible. The market wasn't big enough. Let's talk about the, the next step that you took then. You founded IINet Technologies Proprietary Limited, incorporated in 1993. What, what made you want to bring those experiences with the internet that you'd seen during your university days to the masses? I mean, you had a small cohort, I think you, you mentioned there, of people that had used the internet and wanted to continue to use it. But how did you, how did you want to sell the, the sort of vision of this is how powerful the internet could be? Well, it Again, it was, it, the expectation really was that this was just a niche product that was only going to be really available for people that had deep technical skills. So I, again, in the first year or two, it was really just getting out there and telling everyone about all the stuff you could do with this. And that meant, you know, for, for pe people that were deeply technical, no problem. So people that had, you know, university experience in this um, or the, the classic hacker at home that really understood it, no problems. For everyone else, it meant a site visit to go out there and help them set up and show them how to use it. So it was quite slow going. But it did also feel like evangelism. You know, there wasn't a case of I'm trying to sell my product. It was just a case of this is so cool. Yeah, um, you, you know, you've just got to get online and try it out. And once you do, you'll never go back. And, um, and, and of course, that will, for the first couple of years, that was inch by inch. It took a year to get those first 200 customers. Then October 94, Netscape was released. And Netscape operated on Windows 3.11. So until then, it was really Mac users or um, Unix users that had access to the World Wide Web which had only just been created. But after that, it was Windows could access it as well, and then everything changed. So we went from 200 customers to 1,000 customers in three months after that, and then it was just hang on for dear life. Um, there were, Telstra and Optus were not in the industry. They, at the time, again, you know, it seems naive in retrospect, but at the time when Windows 95 came out, it didn't have any internet support. 
there was a view that the internet itself was too chaotic, it was barely, barely held together at all. Um, so private gardens were more likely to be the way of the future. So America Online, Microsoft Network, CompuServe, they were curated content that was available to members only in those areas. Um, and, but, but then a year later in 1996, you know, Bill Gates made the decision, no, I got that wrong. And he pivoted the business 180 degrees to focus entirely on adding internet support across all of his products. Um, so really, that, but that, that, and not likewise Telstra and Optus at the time, this was bulletin board si systems, it was a hobbyist type area. There was no expectation it would be mass market, so they left us to it. And so Telstra entered by acquiring the Australian Academic Research Network in 1997, and it became retail a year later along with Optus in about 98 as well. I want to touch on that expansion phase that you went through in particular between 93 and, and 97. I think by 97 you were generating in excess of about 4 million in revenue per annum and you had about 5,000 or so customers. You acquired your business partners, share in the business and, and moved into an office in Perth CBD. Walk us through from the garage of your your, your family home in, in Padbury to Perth CBD and, and what happened next? Yeah, well, I mean, it was it was initially just just me and my business partner Michael um, at my parents' house. Um, so, you know, him and his then girlfriend, later wife, would pop in. She'd bang on my door to wake me up. She'd go have a cup of tea with my parents, and then we'd all sort of stumble into the other office. And we ended up then adding in, um, you know, we hired another couple of staff over over the next couple of years. So we were now at five people operating out of the garage. And um, the next step for us, we'd expanded throughout Western Australia in 94, 95. So, you know, 2J, Bunbury, um, Gingin, uh, Rockingham, so around the, this area, and then further into Geraldton and Kalgoorlie and Esperance eventually. But it was, um, the next step was Adelaide. For, and that was common for West Australian businesses, is, you know, going across into the competitive nightmare of Sydney or, or Melbourne seemed like a, a step too far. Adelaide seemed like a very familiar city to go to. So I relocated over there to get ourselves established in South Australia. And, you know, that meant the business needed to find a proper office in Perth. And so we did, we got our first office in, in town and then just continued to grow from there. One of the most critical aspects, I think, in, in my view of the company's success began to take shape during the period we're in under your leadership, you deliberately began to hire staff that had a hospitality or, or tourism yeah. background for, for customer service. Talk us through where you got that idea from and, and how you executed on it. Well, like, like all bad managers, I think that we, we thought the way to hire staff was to hire people just like us. So, you know, we were looking for computing graduates um, that were, you know, deeply technical people to take on the bits that we didn't like. You know, so dealing with phone calls all day from customers, which is 80, 80 to 90% repetitive issues. So, but of course, the, the sort of people like us didn't like doing that either. So, and it was one of our staff members, Glenn Lewis, um, who's still a good friend, who, who made that suggestion. He was going through university, doing his computing degree, but working part-time at a, a five-star hotel. And it, it, that's where he was saying, well, you should hire people from hospitality because, you know, you're paying twice as much as we get paid in the hotels. We already work crazy hours and you've got people that actually like dealing with people. So it was Glenn's idea. But yeah, after that, then I, I was a, a qualified teacher by then. So um, we made a, INET became a registered training organisation. So we would bring people in with no technical background, but they had to have good customer service skills. And then we'd provide a lot of training for them so then they would be able to get Certificate 3, Certificate 4 and eventually a diploma, which were transportable qualifications as well. So we could offer people with no technical background a pathway to, to learn all the skills on the job and to have a qualification that they could take on to the next company as well. Along those lines, I think you also implemented around the, the late 90s, you were the first business I think in Australia to implement the Net Promoter Score system. Where did you get that from and how critical was it in the, in the success of the business moving forward? We, we were. We'd expanded by then. It was a little bit later than that. It was probably um, around 2005. Um, and we, we'd, we'd expanded across into the eastern states and even into New Zealand. And I guess one of the issues we had was in, in a small business, you, you don't need to write down what the culture is. Um, people look to the founders and they say, well, how do they act in that situation? And, you know, if the founders are dishonest and rip customers off, then that's the that's the behaviour that'll get uh, flowed through the business. If the founders are genuinely saying, we've got to do whatever it takes to help this customer every single time, then that's the behaviour that gets emulated. I mean, what do most staff want at the end of the day? They want to go home saying, my boss thinks I did a good job. You know, and nobody wants a surprise after six or 12 months where the boss sits down and says, look, you're a screw up. I, didn't, I, never, I never thought you were working really well. 
we all want a bit of predictability. We want tomorrow to look quite a lot like yesterday. And, and so it was trying to matter, as the business expanded, you couldn't do that. You, you know, with people operating in Sydney that have never even met the founders and, and don't know, really know what's, what's required. So yeah, we, we sat down, we wrote down all the values and tried to do that. But again, every company has that. And you, you'll see, you know, big banks that'll talk about, you know, putting the customer first, but their behavior does not reflect that. Um, and you know, so I think writing it down wasn't enough. Um, NPS sort of gave us a little bit of a, a pathway through that where we could start saying, we're going to use this, that magic question of, you know, would you recommend this company to your friends and family? Uh, and, you know, it's, it's, we had CSAT before that, but CSAT's a, a very big stick, you know, particularly in Australia. If you ask someone, were you satisfied with the results of that transaction? They'll typically say yes, because we don't want conflict. If you say no, I wasn't happy, then you're lining yourself up for a bunch of questions afterwards that you don't want to deal with, you want to get off the phone. Uh, whereas NPS with this zero to 10 gives you a lot more granularity. Getting someone up to a nine or a 10 which is a net promoter, is really hard. Australians are more likely to put someone down as a seven or an eight, which they would still see as being, yeah, I was pretty happy with that, but it didn't blow me away. And that's not confrontational to say you're an eight. Uh, whereas, you know, getting it up to nine or 10 meant each transaction, each engagement with a customer had to be outstanding. So it just started to get that into that area of how do we deliver really awesome customer service that people want to talk about at barbecues. And how did you go about getting them up to a nine or 10, what were some of the components of that? Well, I think it, it, it is about consistent messaging across the whole company. And, you know, a lot of the, I, I used to cringe about the whole, we started in a garage story and I learned to love it. You know, I, there was a, a guy out of um, London Business School, Jay Conger, who wrote a lot about the power of stories in business. And I'm Irish, so we all love sitting around telling stories. And again, therefore there was a bit of cringe about this, about, but, but you realize, no, 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 these, these stories are the things that hold us together and give the organization a consistent culture. And it's nothing that, you know, the Telstra or Optus or even TPG um, could replicate because they didn't have that story. This was unique to us about where we started and why we started coming out of small business in Western Australia and growing to be a national company. So we, we tried to embrace that. And then we'd ask, we'd always had this idea of, you know, even as we always have to act like a small business. Even though we're now a billion dollar business with thousands of staff, we still have to act as if we're a small business. And so on every call, you've got to ask yourself, well, if this was my sister or if this was my, my, my dad on the phone, would, it, would, I have, would I have done a bit more? And, and try and every time go and stretch and just say, no, look, I'm going to really do everything I possibly can to get you online or to explain to you why that's not possible today. Because you know, I would have that conversation with my brother, right? I'd be able to say, look, that just can't be done. And you can have difficult conversations which are honest and true as well and, and and but then you know having done that for 20 minutes on this call you've got to hang up and do it again on the next one and and nps gave us a way to do it and we used to always say the absolute score was not that important you know whether it's a 40 or an 80 or a minus 10 honestly that's not important what's what's important is the variability over time is it getting better and you know if you're getting 50 and the guy next to you is getting 10 with the same calls and the same context each day, then what's, what's the variation there? What is it people like about dealing with you instead of dealing with that person? And then try and get the essence of that out. But you know, from a business point of view, we, we, we learned you know, NPS was tightly linked. But my maths background again, the correlation was close to 0.9 between NPS and churn. So surprise, surprise, customers call up and if they said they were unhappy, they were more likely to leave. If they said they were really happy, they were more likely to stay. So once you could draw that link, businesses, annuity-based businesses like banks, insurance companies, telcos, are extremely sensitive to churn, much more so than sales. So, you know, new customers, we were about 200 times more sensitive to retention than we were to new sales. And I think that's a, you know, in, in a restaurant maybe, um, a bad example, but a box mover, typically the cost of a new customer and the cost of a lost customer are very similar. In a telco, if, you, if a customer stays for longer, then that customer is worth more because they're continuing to pay you. That, that The first year is very expensive, onboarding the customer, helping them out, getting started. But every year after that becomes a lot more profitable for the company. So you, you have this wonderful thing where, you know, giving a customer a good experience actually is excellent business, right? <laughs> Which is what we'd all like to believe, right? You'd like to believe that if I work really hard and the customer is happy, then that'll pay off in the long run. But actually proving that up that, you know, you can go from customer feedback to churn rates to actual profitability of the company which allowed you to build business cases then. You could look at the transactions and we got north of 10,000 feedback forms from customers every day. 
you could look at those then and sort of drill in and say, well, what are the issues here that are making customers unhappy? What would it cost to fix that? And then you could build a business case out because you'd know exactly how much that would save you, how much money it would make. So clearly an emphasis right from those early days on, on customer service. I also want to pick you up on the story in terms of listing the business on the ASX in 99 and then also, and you touched on it earlier, some of the acquisitions that you were beginning to make originally in Adelaide and later uh, in New Zealand and Melbourne and Sydney. On the listing, what, what made you decide to pursue that path for the business? Well, I bought my business partner out and um, borrowed money to do that because the company was a cash flow business. It didn't have any ability to borrow money, didn't really have any assets. So I borrowed money. Um, you know, my only asset was I had $15,000 of equity in my house. So they make you put the house up as collateral. We say, well, you can only lose it once, right? So, <laughs> so you, I borrowed the money for that. But then the only way to pay that back realistically was a listing. Um, and so we, we looked at that. And this was a very unique window in time. And 1999 was the, you know, right at the height of the dot-com boom. And so there was a lot of other dot-coms, um, online businesses that weren't making money, um, that weren't even making revenue at the time. And the measure was all about eyeballs. You know, how many eyeballs have you got? How many viewers have you got? Um, and then the idea was at some point in the future, we'll find a way to make money off them. So there was a lot of crazy transactions getting up and, and people were making huge amounts of money. But the Australian institutions often had mandates that meant they couldn't invest in a company if it wasn't predicting a profit or revenue. So INET comes onto the scene predicting for FY2000 about a 19 million of revenue and about a 10% NPAT margin. So all of a sudden you have a business that looks a lot like a dot com and it's got II net in it, so it looked good and they were allowed to invest in it. So very luckily for that time, we ended up with a gold class register. Um, you know, a lot of those other dot coms were often, you know, mum and dad investors playing past the parcel with the hope that someone else would buy the shares at an inflated cost in the future. Um, in INET's case, we got mostly super, you know, superannuation and institutional investors, which again held us in good stead. Once the dot com collapsed um, in 2001, um, those shareholders bought in further. So we ended up with companies like, I think, say Colonial and Australian Ethical that ended up with large slabs of shares and really supported us through, through that period. I think I'm correct in saying that on the acquisition piece, particularly in the early days, you'll pick up a lot of businesses that were sort of run as a side venture or run by hobbyists almost yeah. with, with no real long-term um, likelihood of, of success. Talk us through the, the acquisition phase that you went through. I think there was about 40 or 50 that were done in a period of, of 12 years, um, some you know, in the sort of 71, 72 million dollar mark. Uh, I have, I think, in New Zealand and then later Aussie Mail in 2005 for about 100 mil. Talk us through where you got that strategy for growth by acquisition versus organic growth. Like a lot of our history, it was good luck rather than good planning. Um, in the 90s, we offered wholesale access to other internet service providers in Western Australia. Remember, Telstra and Optus weren't in the game yet. So if someone was a bulletin board system and they wanted to get access to the internet, um, we would talk to them and end up cutting a deal with them. And, and we became a wholesale provider to most of the you know, internet service providers in Western Australia, um, which means we had to find a way to be able to build them for it. So we wrote the code into the Linux kernel to be able to do traffic accounting. Um, the cost of data then was about $2 a megabyte for data sent and received internationally and about $1.50 for domestic data. So it was, you know, someone could really bankrupt us if you just didn't measure the traffic properly. And so we had that written and that was unique. So people were happy to, other smaller ISPs were happy to sign up with us and become a wholesale customer because then we could provide all the traffic accounting for them, for their customer base as well. So we ended up with dozens of them. That was great because it gave us scale, which means we were able to buy at cheaper costs as well. So it was a nice little virtuous circle. But, but one thing we hadn't predicted is it meant these guys, when they got to that point of, well, business has gotten too hard, I don't like talking to customers, I don't like managing staff, um, I've run out of cash and managing a business. These things were not what they got into the business for. They were hobbyists that loved the internet. And now they find themselves having to run an actual business. Um, it means we became the natural acquirer. So for those early acquisitions, our billing system handled multiple brands, multiple ISPs out of the box. And again, it wasn't part of the plan, but then they would call us up and say, look, I don't want to go on anymore. My customers have prepaid, so they might have paid an average of three months in advance. You pay $100 for three months of internet access, let's say, or $400 for years of internet access. That's a liability to the customer. So if you decide to shut down the business today, you've got to pay the customer back. So they would say to us, 
I'll give you the business if you'll just take care of those customers and take care of that liability for me. So that became fairly typical exit for these smaller guys. And again, it just meant, for us, it just was a matter of, yeah, sure, we'll take on those customers. They became our customers. They were already on our network anyway, and our billing system already handled the, the, the individual um, different brands. So that was really the, the good luck, but it set us up then as we got towards the IPO in 1999, we could buy larger businesses and had the capability to be able to do it. I think it also contributed to the culture. Like we bought an ISP called OIS, and it was only 2,000 customers, but they were in administration. We acquired them and we got swamped. You had 2,000 people calling up instantly straight away saying, how do I get connected now? My, my, the phones aren't working, nothing's working. And we put out the call to our staff. You know, if you've got a, a sister, a brother, a girlfriend, a parent, a child who can start on Monday, we will hire them. And so I think, you know, the business already had a bit of a family feel to it, but that sort of doubled down on it. You know, now we ended up with people that were all in somehow related to the existing staff. And, and of course, you end up therefore with advocates as well within the company. So and one of the other aspects that I found particularly interesting in that sort of early to mid 2000s period was uh, in terms of the products that you're offering consumers, you weren't the cheapest by any means, but you sort of managed to, to find a balance between offering um, service, between offering value, and then the actual product offering itself. How did you managed to continue to grow market share by not being the cheapest, but just by focusing obviously on customer service, which you've spoken about, but also on value. It is one of those dilemmas of market research. If you, if you just follow what's on social media or what your surveys show, you can lead to invalid conclusions. So even current data will show somewhere around 80, 85% of customers say their number one um, reason for choosing a particular telco or ISP is price. Um, but their behavior doesn't match that. So the consumer will, you know, a clear example here is Telstra. You know, Telstra has about 50% market share in, in, near enough in mobile and in broadband. They're definitely not the cheapest. So if 85% of customers are saying price is my number one priority, why are half of them going to Telstra? So I think it's, it's don't necessarily listen to what people say they're looking for. You know, we don't want the cheapest handbag. We don't want the cheapest shoes or the cheapest holiday. It's some perception of value. And I guess INET tried to bridge that with um, the, 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 the principal values going back to the very beginning of the business was, you know, this is cool technology, you should be online. And, um, and the small business background, you know, we'll take care of you. This is tough, this is complicated, but once you get online, we'll take care of you. So this was this innovation backed up by good service. So win the customers on leading products and then hold on to them through exceptional service. And I think that was the themes that was behind the brand all the way through. And, you know, it, we, we, we did our first advertising in 2008, and that was what we were trying to get across, this idea. We briefed an agency on it saying, look, I, I always feel like if I could get into the lounge room with any family and just tell them what we're here for, that they would definitely sign up for us, you know, if you could know what we're trying to do. And, um, but how do you do that? And, and one by one. And, and again, it goes back to you look at the other brands at the time. You know, Telstra was big blue, it was safe. It was the best option for safety, even though you knew you'd be paying a bit more. Um, Optus had these funky animals that no one really understood at the time. TPG was purple and price. Um, INET was the only one that we thought we could put a face to and do that conversation with people. So we found that actor um, here in Perth um, who, who became the, the face of INET and you know, was telling that story about, you know, we, we're, we're different from the others. We're, we, we can explain, we, we, we were looking for someone that was like your slightly geeky older brother who was still cool, you know, someone who would explain the technology to you and be excited about it, but wouldn't make you feel like an idiot either. And that's a, that's a tough line, right? You want, you, you, too often we go to someone who is very technical and they make you feel stupid. And we didn't want that either. So. And if I'm not mistaken, had an Irish accent as well. Yes, I do remember. I do was remember. That by the, coincidence it was by coincidence. I remember the agency uh, was a bit embarrassed about that. It was a Perth based agency called Meerkats, and they, they casted nationally, had about 250 actors um, audition for it, and 25 of our staff. We, we thought it might be a staff member who got this role, and that would have been great, you know. Um, but but you know, they said, look, we, we've got our preferred candidate here, but for reasons you'll understand later, we're a bit cautious about saying who, who our preferred candidate is. So we're going to give you 10 of the reels and you can watch the 10 reels. And you know, in each case, they were given two scripts to go through of a, a you know, 20 or 30 second ad and they just had to go through the scripts. And they were all very, very good, including one of our staff who made it to the final 10. But um, in this case, the, the actor here, David, in his reel, it ran for about, I can't remember now, like 15 minutes. 
And he kept on, you know, he'd read this out and go, no, 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 hang on, I can do better than that. And he'd walk off stage and come back on and ad lib something completely different that he'd come up with. And he just kept on doing that. And yeah, so he was Irish. Well, he also came out to, from Ireland when he was about eight years old um, from Dublin, but he had a, a, he lived with his Irish family here in Perth. And uh, yeah, but he was outstanding and uh, he still is. I mean, it's very unusual for a, the face of any brand to stay relevant, you know, we're 15 years later now. And, uh, but he's had staying power. Before we move on, you mentioned innovation before. Just touching on that innovation piece, uh, you were the first um, or certainly one of the early adopters of recognising the power of this triple play product where basically you would have uh, broadband, telephony and I forget the other one. Um, uh, was mobile. Mobile. Um, walk us through you know, that aspect of the strategy rather than just being a broadband provider or rather than just being, being a mobile provider. Where did you recognise and how did you implement that strategy that said, right, we're going to compete in all three, particularly VoIP as well. I think you're yeah. one of the early pioneers here. Um, I, I hug, we acquired iHug in 2003 and iHug had a, a telephony product as well. So they were selling internet with phone. And it was just long distance calls at the time in Australia. Uh, but, but I guess we'd seen this in Europe. It was very common, the triple play. Um, over there, it was you know a broadband um, home phone and pay TV. That was the the classic triple play for cable providers across there. And you know the the prevailing wisdom, which applies into other industries as well, like banking and insurance, was if customers buy two or more products, they're much more sticky. So and and so it wasn't really that complicated. You know, selling people long distance phone calls, you don't typically need any tech support on your long distance phone calls. You just use your phone and it works. So from our point of view, it was pure profit margin for we already had the billing relationship by the nature of the you know of the broadband we know where you live and we have your payment details so saying here's an additional product that doesn't have a lot of extra technical support requirements it was an easy add-on uh, we did find not all of them were natural natural um uh, bundles mobile you know the, the the choice of your home phone and your broadband is a household choice whereas mobile is an individual choice so we did sell quite a lot of mobile, but the, 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 it's not ne nearly as sticky a proposition as it was for those household choices. So whoever chooses the phone, the broadband and the um, pay TV, that's the, the household decision maker. Whereas each person in the house chooses their own mobile phone provider. So it wasn't always right. We tried lots of different things. And that's again, if you want that um, idea of being innovative, it means you've got to keep innovating. Um, and again, the, the nature of our, of our customer base, because they come to us wanting cool new products. It means one of the advantages we had over, say, Telstra was we could try out new things on our customer base and they could break. And people were in for that. In fact, they felt like, you know, we're excited about trialing this new product. And if it's, you know, if you're providing feedback along the way, then that's part of being at the cutting edge. Whereas Telstra could not have done that to their customer base. That would have made them, the, the, the advantage of their brand was that safety thing. So if they were trialling new products on their customer base, that would make them seem unsafe. So it was, again, it was a fortunate positioning that we were able to keep on doing those things. So we've exported, obviously, a, a large component of the history of IONET. I want to get a, an understanding as to the, the, how you managed to scale the business from essentially a one-man or two-man operation in 93 to a business that was turning over a billion dollars in, in revenue per annum, 2,000 plus staff, I think, by 2014. How, how different was the, the change from managing this sort of small startup business to all of a sudden running Australia's second largest ISP with that, that amount of people, that amount of money? Um, how did you manage that sort of change? It, it, it was obviously a very different proposition. Um, I'd like to say, you know, strategy is less, often less about um, what actions you're going to do and about themes and thematics. And in, certainly in INET's case, that, that innovation and service ended up being winning propositions. And again, this is one of those Darwinian things. Um, I don't think we won because we had in really intelligent uh, strategy. Um, it was more, almost more the opposite, as in there was a thousand ISPs out there in the year 2000, and the ones that had those attributes are the ones that continued to survive. So we were good at business because we had to list. You know, and then that meant we didn't even have a budget. We didn't, didn't have any accountants on staff when we listed. We didn't even have a forward budget. If there was money in the bank, we spent it. If there was no money in the bank, you didn't spend it. So that was as complicated as it got. But the listing process, man, we had to go through and, and get a lot more disciplined about these things. Uh, and again, the acquisitions was not a clear strategy. It was something that came to us and we said, yeah, let's make that happen. And we had the capability to do it. 
the billing system, I wrote the billing system and the initial CRM and the HR systems. And again, they, those, we, I wanted them, programmers are lazy, you know, you, you say, I don't want to have to keep on doing paperwork here, so I'm going to automate that instead. And your whole idea is how do I stop having to do more, more work on this? We automate it. And that allowed us to expand, but it wasn't necessarily, the, the purpose of writing this was not so we could expand internationally. The purpose was to get our systems cleaner and more consistent. And then that gave us the capability to be able to expand. Uh, another thing I think is probably unique in terms of I've compared this with other businesses that have done acquisitions is we often got the target people to stay. So by the time I left, well over half the senior team had come from prior acquisitions. So our you know, chief operating officer, the head of product, the head of engineering, uh, you know, the, the head of our integrations team had all come from prior acquisitions. So you often got a former CEO who's now been running their business for a while and we're like, well, you know, I'm still gonna run this place, mate, but um, is there something you'd be interested in doing? And give them something to run off and have a try on themselves and, and, the, and the permission to fail. Again, we had one of our sayings was, you know, fail often but fail cheap. So if you, if you, you know, we've got to try, if you're going to be innovative, you've got to keep trying new things and not all of them will succeed. So you've got to have this feeling of, you know, if you want staff to take risks, then it has to be okay to fail. So a well-executed failure, we used to say, will be rewarded just as much as a well-executed success. So, and, um, but that was one of the things I think that gave us a bit of an advantage was you had all these staff in there that had done, that, that built their own businesses and now they're sitting inside another company that's growing and exciting and being part of that as well. Just on exactly that, the, the integration piece, there wouldn't be too many companies out there today, particularly in Australia, that would have acquired that many businesses over, over such a short period of time. How do you integrate different management teams or different cultures into the II net? I mean, how did you go about that process? The things we would take advantage of straight away was the checkbook and policies. You know, so this is the way we hire staff, this is the way we manage staff. Those are the policy platforms that were in place. And a lot of those are required because we're a listed company. And the checkbook, obviously, you know, you can't spend a lot of money without centralised approvals. So that, that kind of was taken for granted. But then rolling onto the best of breed can be a dangerous idea. So saying to people, we're going to choose the best of breed can create warring camps. The people that have just been acquired are saying, well, my, my solution was better than yours, so we should use mine. So there had to be an element of, look, we're going to use the INET way, um, but if you've got ideas there, then we're really keen to see them implemented as well. And so there, there was this notion of the, the II Borg, you know, that we used to talk about, you know, you will be assimilated, resistance is futile. But, but being part of the, the community after that, um, the, the Borg, meant that you, 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 know, you had the chance to implement a lot of those things that work better. So I think that the, the, the systems were powerful. And a lot of times, you know, when we're buying a company, that, that business is X growth. So that's why the founders want to get out. There, there's something that's happened there. They're no longer excited by it. Um, it's stopped growing, whatever. And then you get bought by another company, which is growing and it is exciting and it has direction and purpose. So a lot of the staff, that's why they joined that other company in the first place is to be part of a growth industry. And here you are now with still being part of another growth company. So I, I think it, it became quite infectious to get people on board. Um, but yeah, we were, meticulous about integrating everyone onto common systems. I, I'm, I know of another um, aggregator at the time who kept all of their companies separate. So they, they bought all these other companies and then ended up with maybe a dozen businesses that were still operating on separate billing systems, for instance. So you couldn't properly integrate your call centres, for instance, because staff would have to be trained on each system. Whereas we, we thought, no, we're going to bring them all onto common systems, common network, common product, common call centres. And you, we might have um, aggregate, you might have segmented by by product type, like we had a separate business call centre from a residential call centre, but we didn't have a separate Westnet and a separate INET and a separate internet call centre. They were all into the same staff ultimately. And part of that, I mean, initially this was a project team, a virtual project team with a, a dedicated project manager and a, a project officer to start with, but then, you know, you could, here's the person in engineering you can talk to and here's the person in finance you can talk to. But as the acquisitions became business as usual, this was not an opportunistic transaction. That was every single month there was another transaction coming in. So that team became full time. So we ended up with, I think, 83 full time staff in the integrations team. And that was just making sure that every acquisition got properly integrated back into the business. So clearly a, a remarkable 21 year uh, journey up until 2014. I read that running a business from Western Australia, or no doubt you were travelling extensively to, to Melbourne and Sydney and New Zealand and South Africa where you had a call centre and, and so many other places. How difficult was that, running a, 
business from WA and what sort of toll was that beginning to take on you by 214? Well, it was a lot of travel. I mean, WA is an interesting place to emerge from because um, one of our core strategies was Fortress WA. Um, this was, you know, there were ISPs that were larger than us in, in Australia, but nobody had that much concentration in a single city. So we had, you know, we were the number one in Western Australia, the only city in Australia where Telstra was not number one. And that was a big difference because it allowed us to build our own infrastructure in Perth, which meant that we had much higher margins operating on our own equipment across here than even our larger competitors that were, say, spread across three cities on the East Coast. So that, that was a, a powerful start. And that also meant that we had to remember that even as we focused on growth on the East Coast, you had to carefully take care of the customers back in Western Australia. So Fortress WA was foundational. You know, and, and again, we had a principle of you never offer a product to a new customer that you aren't willing to offer to a current one. So same thing would apply. You know, we would never spend a lot more money on East Coast customers than we were willing to spend on our own customers in WA. So I think that, that was a, and yeah, I mean, I was trying to think of other brands that have emerged from Western Australia. And, uh, you know, there's ones like Canva, of course, that went straight to the US, but a lot of the others have been bought. But I, I came up with one yesterday, which is really obvious, which is Bunnings. And again, they're a, a world beater, I think, in terms of their model. Um, but, but so it, it is a powerful place to emerge from with a good parochial base. Um, there was no, I hope it's a blanket saying, but I can't think of anyone that came out of Brisbane. So Power Up sold out to Aussie Mail in 1999. And I can't think of another strong brand that emerged from Brisbane, which would have had the same attributes of that parochial base. Um, Adelaide had Internode, SE Net, um, uh, Adam Internet. So they did produce some of those strong local brands that went national as well. You mentioned the, the power of the innovation um, sort of ecosystem and, and um, the willingness to, to try new things in WA. What, what drives that, do you think? What, what is the power of entrepreneurship in WA that perhaps other states don't have? Is it because it is slightly isolated as compared with the East Coast city, so people are more willing to, to get up and have a go here? Do I, I do think that isolation is, and we're quite proud of that in Western Australia. And um, I, I, I spent a bit of time in Brisbane during COVID and I think people in Queensland often think that they have that sort of, um, that feeling of, you know, down south is a little bit, bit out there, but it's 10 times more than that in Western Australia. And if you're not here, I think it's hard to appreciate that. If we could be another thousand or 2000 kilometres away from Canberra, we would take it in a heartbeat. Um, and, and, you know, that, that classic thing, the most isolated capital city in the world, and, you know, we're closer to Asia than we are to the East Coast, and bloody Canberra keeps on taking all of our profits to run the rest of the country. Those things are real on the ground across here. But um, what are the positive sides of that? Well, most of the money in Western Australia is first generation. So the people that have got a lot of depth here, it's not institutional money like you particularly see, say, Melbourne, um, or, or, you know, money from large organisations and businesses like you would see in Sydney. Um, in Western Australia, the money is concentrated in the hands of people that probably made it themselves. Um, so I think that's a, an interesting starting point. There is plenty of money around. You know, this is the only state that did not go through a negative growth during COVID, for instance, it continued to power on and carry the whole nation, of course. Um, but <laughs> but um, I think the other one is this percentage of people in small business. And I don't know if this is still true, but I know Western Australia had the largest percentage of people employed by small business in the country. And uh, whereas, you know, say Adelaide, other than Canberra had the highest percentage of people employed by government and, um, and uh, multinationals. Uh, so th I think there's always been that notion in Perth of I could be the next Andrew Forrest, Kerry Stokes, you know, David, uh, Mark Creasy, you know, that this notion of that everyone can get out there and give it a go, which um, I know we, we lost that in Ireland, where I, where I come from, is no one in the west coast of Ireland thinks they're going to go out and set up a, a multinational corporation out of, out of Ennis. Whereas Perth, there's still that sincere belief that people coming out, I still see people out of year 12 thinking that's what I'm going to do. And that's precious. Um, so the money's here. I think the entrepreneurial spirit's here. Uh, the, the test market is here. And then it's a matter of, can you take that out to a national, international audience? Fantastic traits to have for, for any state. And, yeah. and I'm sure um, we'll see many more businesses arise out of WA moving forward. Just to close out this chapter, you stood aside as CEO of IINet in 2014 after a couple of months sabbatical. What prompted that decision and then walk us through the deal, I think uh, $1.56 billion or thereabouts in 2015 to TPG? Uh, the board asked me to take a sabbatical. I hadn't taken any holidays and had a lot of accumulated leave. And so I did take a couple of months off and you know, when I came back, you know, it was pretty clear it was time to move on. The business was at a, an interesting point. We just acquired Transact and Internode. Um, we had a, a three-year plan, 
um, but the foundations of that were actually already in place. I mean, Internode's an interesting one is we, we, we had about $8 million worth of cost savings by aggregating the two networks. And that was done before the deal closed. The engineers at Internode and the engineers at INET got all this happening before we'd even written the final checkout. So it was the, the real benefits out of the business were already just needed to be, you know, let to, let to unfold. So I guess it was a, you know, it was a, I'm the sort of person as well is that I, I like fixing things. And if there's nothing to fix, I'll probably break it so I can fix it. You know, that's the managing in a crisis is actually a lot easier um, that than, than managing through periods where you need to get, you know, lots of consensus and, and you know, teamwork behind things and long term planning. Uh, so I think that was, was you know, in retrospect, it was the right time, even though it was tough at the time. Um, the, the acquisition occurred after that. So the company was approached by TPG um, and offered a a no shop, no talk deal, um, and the board accepted that at the time. Um, I was long gone from the business. Perhaps the, the founder at TPG, David Teo, perhaps he'd always seen me as a bit of a blocker, as in there's no point approaching INET while Michael's there because he doesn't want to sell anyway. Um, that wasn't necessarily true, but I could understand if that was the perception. The share price had declined a bit, um, about 15%, um, after those results had come out, um, after the first year. And I think perhaps TPG saw an opportunity there to go in. Um, so I, I worked with some other shareholders, you know, just talked to some other shareholders. We were not collaborating, of course, um, and we just didn't feel the offer was, was adequate. So that's where we tried to flush out a counter bid at the time. And M2 did come out with a counter bid. And that eventually meant TPG came back with another, another bid, a much more enhanced and favorable bid, which we, we all accepted. So that's the, the history and the evolution of IONET just once you were uh, 2015 saying you'd sold out of your, your shareholding completely from IINet, what, what 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 did you do next? What was your sort of feelings, you know, post-transaction once it had all gone through, 21 years, 22 years of your life? What do you, how do you wake up the next morning and think, well, that part of my life's done, what's the next chapter look like? That, that was really hard. I mean, this I'd been working since I was eight years old. You know, I, you know, I was school and family business and then into INET straight out of university. And you know, to, to wake up and have an empty calendar was the most frightening thing I can remember. And I, I certainly, I moved across to Sydney. I didn't want to be, I needed a fresh start. If I'd stayed in Perth, I still would have been catching up with the same people and going through the old war stories and so on. And, and that would have been a great life, but you know, hard to move on. So I moved across to New South Wales at the, at, at the time and decided to start there. And I guess I had a philosophy of, if anyone contacted me for a coffee, I'd say yes. And just sort of say, let's, let's have a chat and see. And I really thought, I think within a year, I'd be starting up another company or perhaps even taking on a professional CEO role and doing that. But again, I got tapped on the shoulder for a couple of non-executive director roles. So, you know, some, some people that I'd known beforehand just gave me calls and said, are you interested? This company is going to an IPO um, or, you know, in the case of Seven West, if Kerry Stokes answer calls, then you answer if you're from Perth. So, and it was, that was a great opportunity as well. Um, yeah, so it, it's, it wasn't, again, I didn't leave INET thinking my next phase is in becoming a director. Um, it, 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 the opportunities were there. The first one was like, yeah, I can do one and still become a CEO. And then the second one was like, oh, this is really cool. I'll do this one too. And then I found myself with a portfolio of them. And it's really interesting because, you know, if you've got four or five companies, one of them's always in crisis. And that's, you know, that's where directors can actually step in and help out. And, and be there. But, and of course, hopefully in the other ones, using that experience from across other companies, you can use it to help the other companies avoid a crisis, right? <laughs> um, but I've got, I've, I've got um, we talked about wise tech before. One of the sayings from the founder there is that um, uh, difference, different is not necessarily better, but better is always different. And I think that's really, particularly in founder-led businesses, I think that's a really good insight because um, you know, the things that make wise tech number one in its sector if you try and bring best practice to a company like that then you'll be average by definition so there has to be something in there to say well how do we you know we don't want to be crazy and reinvent everything from first principles but you also don't want to take the this is the way they do it at 30 other companies so this is the way you should do it here so it's always interesting with the boards you know you can't walk in and say well i've been on 30 companies before and this is the way you should do it um, particularly founder-led companies, that does not go down well. And I love the founder-led companies, you know, because they're, they're very typical, you know, you, you don't have any um, illusions about culture. The cult, in a founder-led company, the culture of the company is the culture of the CEO. That's just the way it is. Um, you can write whatever you want on the, 
the values and principles, but the way the founder acts and what that person wants and believes in, that's what permeates the organisation. And, um, and that they're always high growth and high aspiration as well, so it's always good fun. I think I read a, a similar quote of yours, which was lead on product, differentiate on service, which yep. I think is, is incredibly uh, useful for, for any business in, in any sector. Post-transaction or post-2015, I should say, I think one of the first businesses uh, that you joined, you co-founded and then later led as chairman was Diamond Cyber, which you then subsequently sold to CyberCX in, in 2019. How do you see that the cyberspace has evolved in Australia, awareness of cybersecurity and just the explosion in cybersecurity businesses now? Well, Diamond Cyber was um, the, the founder, the, the, you know, the CEO there was a guy called Sven Ross, um, who was straight out of the military. Um, and this was the principle initially was that, the, you know, we took often the military in all countries is often behind commerce when it comes to technology. Um, they're a fast follower. Um, in, in cybersecurity, I, I think it was the other way around, the military was well ahead of the commercial sector. So I guess our principle there was, can we get people that are formerly in the military and bring that, that capability and, and skill set into, into the private sector? So our primary customers were enterprise and government. Um, my background was all in really mass market retail. So very, very different. Uh, so, you know, I might have provided some early relationships and some money, but really Sven and the team ran that one. But it was sexy. You know, this cyber security at the time, we picked the timing very well. Um, and but, and we, we're charging for time and time-based businesses don't scale well. So, you know, because when, when we had four or five people, everyone's billing, um, it's, it's quite a profitable business and a lot of fun to be in. Once you get up to 10 or 20 staff, then you've got to have business development, accounts receivable, um, logistics. So you have to add in all this extra costs across the business and you're not getting 100% out of the other staff because you need them to be doing training and you know, travel time and all those sorts of things. So it becomes much more difficult. Um, hence, we got to about 23 full-time staff when CyberCX approached and you know, I was disappointed to exit because again, it was people would say to me, what are you doing now? You explain non-exec director to them and they're like, I don't understand. You tell them about the cybersecurity business, and it was like, oh, that's cool, you know. <laughs> but it was the right time to exit. And as you said, CyberCX now I think has 1,700 staff across the country and is doing very, very well. Uh, you know. You've served on a, a number of boards and currently serve on a number of boards. You mentioned WiseTech before, Seven West Media as well. What's it like being on a board of a media business and how have you seen the media landscape change and evolve over your time that you've been on the Seven West Media board? Um, Traditional media is hard because it's um, it's a declining business. So Seven West is very profitable and and generates good cash flow and it's a very well run business, uh, and yet it's in a declining sector. So and you know our, our chairman has referred to you know the timing of swapping um, analog dollars for digital dimes, and that's tough you know because you, you couldn't go 100% online advertising overnight. It's it's not going to work. And, and the, the traditional media is very valuable. Still something like three quarters of all dollars spent in advertising in Australia is done on TV, radio, newspapers, outdoor. So traditional media is still very powerful. And how do you reach a mass market audience? You know, if you want to sell a product, um, or, or particularly if you want to build a well-known brand like a Woolworths or a Westpac, um, you're not going to do that on Facebook. It, it's very, there's a, a diminishing return on that. So it is, it is hard, but, um, but yeah, most of the businesses I've been in have been high growth businesses that you're starting effectively from zero and increasing your penetration through a, a cool new product. Um, media, traditional media at the moment is a matter of we've got a, a traditionally um, very profitable product and we're managing it into a very different future. So, you know, I think that's, the team has, is much more disciplined about the, the plan and the management of costs, but it's radically different. That said, it's incredibly interesting. You're working with all these young creatives where so much is done on gut, you can't, you can't sort of measure a lot of these things and with any level of certainty say this one's going to work and that one's not. So it's this constant roll of the dice based upon good intuition and history that allows you to say, I think this format's going to work and deliver good returns in the future and those long-term relationships with the big brands. In terms of your uh, portfolio of investments, you've obviously got a, a business called Fi Capital, that's a uh, best, best way to mm -hmm. pronounce it, uh, but then you also invest in, in ventures like Alliston and, and 1013. What are the sectors that you're seeing opportunity over the long term <laughs> in, and what are some of the considerations that you make prior to deploying capital in any new business or venture that you're involved in? One of our long-term investors, this is 20 years ago, said that you know he, he didn't really 
when he looked at businesses, he looked at three different things. Was um, you know, the, the story, did he understand the story, the quality of the people, and the pathway to profitability. And I, I think um, he was talking there about, you know, he was in a superannuation company, so he was talking about very large leaks going into listed companies. Um, but the same thing, I think, applies at the, at the smaller end of town as well. Um, it is still surprises me how many people cannot describe their own business. The classic elevator pitch of, what do you do? You know, how would I describe that to my mum? And they might babble on about their capabilities and the people they've got and the sort of segments they're going after. But even after listening for 15 minutes, you think, I have no idea what it is you're selling. And that's, that's really difficult. So I do, do tend to look at that. Tell me what the compelling proposition is here. And if I can't understand it after a minute, it might be that it's too technical for me, or it might be that the CEO themselves don't understand their own business. So trying to get that compelling story and, um, and then you know, the quality of the people, where their background is, who their supporters are. But then, yeah, the, the one that's become more important, I think, in the last three years is this pathway to profitability. So again, similar to the dot-com boom, anything that was a startup four years ago was attracting incredible amounts of cash. And that's gone away now. So, you know, the number of IPOs in 2022 was down 93%. So getting an IPO up onto the ASX became impossible. That was replicated last year, very similar. Um, and the and part of that is now, who, you know, when, when the tide goes out, who's still wearing shorts? And a lot of these businesses simply didn't have a viable business model. So they're running out of capital. They either can't get any more money to run their business or they're going to have to do it at you know, ridiculous discounts, effectively giving up control of their business. But the people that have been able to sort of say, no, now we've got to make the cash we've got last um, are coming out the other end now, I think with much stronger business models. Generally speaking, you're seeing any sectors or opportunities that you're not currently actively invested in, but that you see long-term growth? Oh, I think that's a how long's a piece of string thing. I mean, everyone's talking about AI, which has started again to become meaningless because you know what, what you know, may just be a very clever piece of coding is now being referred to as AI. So I think, um, yeah, we all know AI is going to transform things, um, but it's, I think it's more useful to so say, well, how, what, what does that specifically mean? You know, a business which says, I'm going to be able to use this to move more of my call center operations or to chat, and therefore I'll be able to improve service levels or reduce costs. That's really specific and interesting. Um, but you know, we had the same thing with blockchain five years ago. Any company that used the word blockchain became sexy for a while. Um, again, blockchain is nothing more than a distributed um, general ledger system. So how does that make your business in any way useful? And if you take the step back and then sort of say, okay, does does um, having unique identifiers for every sheep that gets on a, a, a ship, is that really something that's going to generate lots of future income? Probably not. So the same thing applies, I think, with AI. What is it specifically that's going to make the world better? Why is your product going to be any better than your competitor's product in five years? Um, but yeah, beyond that, I think you know, health is a massive growth space. I'm, invo I'm on the board of Health Engine as well. So saying health and technology is one of those things that's very alluring because health spend is already massive in Australia and everywhere and growing. And the demographics show, you know, the aging population means it's going to be a bigger and bigger sector. But it's, um, it's alarmingly fragmented. And so, you know, normally fragmented spaces from my point of view are good because they're opportunities for a roll up. But the, the, the way in which money gets distributed around the sector is, is crazy complicated and resistant to change and resistant to roll ups. So I think it's, it's also these alluring high level trends don't necessarily translate into a significant business model. Just to close out our discussion with a few more general topics, in terms of your business career, when you reflect on it, what are the, the key learnings? And you, you've been so generous in, in your time, you've already delivered some of those learnings, but if you had to distill it into two or three things, what are the, the, the key fundamentals that you've learned? I think it particularly applies to annuity-based businesses, but for any company, take care of your first 100 customers, whatever it is, whether it's a restaurant or a yoga studio or a technology business, um, your first 100 customers are going to be the ones who tell everyone else that your, your company is excellent. So you've got to love them like family. And I, I, I think, again, that's, you know, you, you can get them involved. If you're open and transparent, you can get them involved in the testing process. So it doesn't mean you have to get the product perfect. Uh, I think that would probably be, so the first lesson I think would be, you know, take care of your early customers, take care of them all, but particularly love the ones at the beginning. But I, I, I think that um, that second point as well is about being open and transparent. Uh, authentic would be the, the modern word for it, I suppose. Um, it, 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 c c people, voters, <laughs> consumers, have become distrustful of, of brands. 
and governments and uh, institutions in general. So, and telling the truth can be really hard. <laughs> but I think being really open and honest about here are the limitations of the product, here's what we're trying to do, um, here's why it might not be right for you and maybe why you want to use Saks Fifth Avenue instead. You know, th these are things I think that actually resonate. And again, you might, if you say to a customer, help a customer off-board as much as you help them on-board, because that customer may be back to you in a year. And if you, make their, if you make them a miserable process today, or get them to buy a product that they don't need, that, that, that has a way of, it might deliver you a three-month benefit, but it has a way of delivering a three-year harm. Um, and that permeates culture as well. You know, if, if, if your staff members, staff members look to the founder. If staff members see the founder as mistreating customers and just saying, look, just, just sell them this product, you know, I know they don't want it, but just sell it anyway. That, that, if, if you know, if you are willing to rip your customers off, I guarantee to you, your staff are willing to rip you off. And I think that's a, you know, something to always keep in mind, <laughs> so. How do you build, just on that, how do you build great a company culture, whether it's a, a company with five people or a company with 2,000, 3,000 plus people? Communicate, communicate, communicate. I mean, it's gotta be consistent and real you know, staff sense and smell a culture that's, that's rubbish. You know, so I mean, I've, again, I can think of uh, banks that might be saying, you know, our number one priority is our customers. They'd be saying that externally, but internally it's, it's a matter of, you've got to sell this product and you've got to hit a quota no matter what. And even if the customer doesn't need it, sell it anyway. That sort of inconsistency is jarring to staff and it means they, they end up, you know, jaded with the company's culture and they won't, they won't believe in it. I know the first company I saw that did it, but I now it's more common is um, uh, HR or people in culture often own the brand. So the first company I saw that had this was Vodafone, where people in culture owned the brand and made sure it was consistent. So the way we the way we say we are internally is consistent with the way we say we are externally in our advertising, and trying to keep that consistency. You know, for staff members, I think that that's a huge deal. Is you know, if we say customers are our number one priority, it doesn't have to be. You know, I can think of, again, an investment bank, I'm thinking of a name here, which was very clear about our job is to make as much money as possible. Now, if you're consistent with that, so your customers understand that alignment and your staff understand it, that's not necessarily a bad thing. You're all on the same page. But if you're going to say, no matter what, we will make sure the customer gets the best outcome here. Our job is your health or your, you know, your, your profitability or to keep you connected. Whatever those messages are, then you've got to align everything behind that message. So you know, at NBN, I think, that the, the possibly one of the mistakes we made is our, our core job at MBN was ubiquitous high-speed broadband. Broadband for everyone in the country. And, and I don't know if we ever really kept our focus on just that, that component, because I think that message of, you know, in, um, if you said to people in metropolitan Australia, look, we're all gonna pay a little bit more for broadband, but it means that our friends and family in the country are gonna have high-speed broadband as well. People would have said, yeah, right, that sounds fair. <laughs> um, you know, and I always remember that if you look to America, you know, if you're in a city, you know, you've got multiple carriers that can deliver you very, very high speed broadband. But, you know, that only goes to about 70% of households in the US. If you're in regional US, there is no social safety net and there's no guarantee of access at all. Whereas I think in Australia, we've said, this is what we're for. This is, we want everyone in the country to have high speed access. And I think the whole organisation has aligned behind that as the vision. In terms of your career, when you reflect on it, proudest achievements and key lessons that you've learned along the way what, and what would they be? There's some weird ones along the way. I mean, I think in, in the first one that comes to mind, weirdly enough, is opening in South Africa. Um, so INET opened a greenfield, all the other sites we'd gone to, we opened in Adelaide, but beyond that, we entered new jurisdictions by acquisitions. Um, Cape Town was a decision we made to go there and decide this is where we're going to put a new call centre. And uh, it was a really, it was an amazing experience. You know, the average, we were paying about six times more than the average national income to the staff in that area. Um, is, you know, year 12, you know, South Africa has guaranteed year 12 education. English is a first language in the Western Cape region. Um, very high youth unemployment, north of 50%. So opening there was really quite a joy. And again, there, were, there was a labor cost arbitrage. You know, a lot of companies go to India or to Manila because they want to save money on the staff. But um, that was certainly an, an element when we went to South Africa. But we looked at the long-term benefits here was that follow the sun. So we had uh, call centers in New Zealand, Australia, and South Africa. Nobody was working unsociable hours. Uh, it doesn't, I, I, I always found, you know, you put people on the graveyard shift, you can take the most wonderful people 
and it's like they will instantly turn into assholes when you put them on a midnight shift after a while because you're disconnected from your, your family and your colleagues. It's really hard. Um, so working on sociable hours is not a long-term good idea. So I think that, that was a real you know, wonderful thing to be involved in. I mean, the whole growth story with iNet was just so exciting. We never felt like we were selling a product. We, we genuinely felt like we were, we were there to, to make the world a bit of a better place. And, and because that you know, connecting people is about the only thing we can do to try and <laughs> make things better, you know, it's, you, people will be people, but if you can at least give them the opportunity to talk to each other, then that has to end up with things a little bit better than they were. But I mean, that meant things like the court case, we ended up taking a copyright case to the high court. Uh, so we had 34 movie studios suing Ironet. And that for us went back to, they were saying, we want you to disconnect people if, if, they're, if they're engaging in this conduct. So on the basis of an accusation, a, you know, an opaque accusation, they would just point at someone and say, someone in that house is doing the wrong thing. And then they wanted us to disconnect them. And we were just like, that's not right. You know, so it, it became one where, because I think our mission was really clear, um, there was no point at which we could have acceded to that. It just became, well, we have to fight this one. We've got to get the good outcome here. Future of Western Australia and, <laughs> and Perth's business community, what's, what's missing, what's required, and, and what's the outlook long term, do you think? The, the Western Australia's greatest strength is its greatest weakness. Um, it's massively overexposed to resources. So every industry in Western Australia is either in resources or supporting it. And um, you know, it's traditionally been a boom bust economy which has been good and healthy. Um, we haven't had a bust now in a long time. You know, we had a softening in 2014, but really I think it's been well over 20 years since the last real downturn in Western Australia, which means now we have a generation that's never seen negative growth in, 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 in here, um, which just means it becomes much easier for governments of every persuasion just to keep riding that wave. So I think um, you know, both sides of politics recognise this, but it's politically very difficult to say, let's invest in something else right now. So I see um, the current government is looking to try and get into creative industries, so setting up movie, movie studio across here. Um, but, you know, it's just really hard. I mean, in INET's case, we would often set up small business units and to try and say, so we had something like domain hosting that was a great business, tens of millions of revenue and growing fast. But compare that with the billion dollars of revenue in the telco arm and all the talent got sucked away back into the core of the business. And so you had these little babies that could have grown into big businesses and they ended up being starved of resources. And I think the same probably applies in Western Australia, you know, trying to set up a new incubator business across here that could give us big benefits in 10 or 20 years. Um, the, the staff somehow inevitably get sucked off into, um, into the resources sector where their salaries are so high and just getting stuff out of the ground is the number one priority. Final question, when you look ahead to the third chapter, call it of your career, first chapter was I on that, second chapter is the multiple board roles that you hold, and mm. Co, Seven West, Health Engine, uh, Wise Tech and others. What does the, the third iteration look like, do you think? Well, I think I've got a bit more to run on this current chapter. Um, I, 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 I still like the idea of setting up something new again, but again, I thought you know, when I left Ionet, I thought what we had there was normal, that I would find another idea and start it and you'd get the same sort of excitement and growth. And of course, it's actually not normal. It was normal at Ironet. <laughs> it wasn't normal once you got out. And um, so I think I'd love to find something else that, that, you know, that had that sort of excitement and opportunity. But um, the board roles are great. And, and you know, I do like you know, the areas I'm in now, telecommunications, um, media and technology. That's a dream run for me, as in I couldn't have arranged, it all arrived by accident, but I couldn't have arranged it better if I'd tried. So I think um, in more of that, I think, in the future. Michael Malone, been a pleasure having the opportunity to share your journey. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Rob.